and welcome to another episode of Bicycle Touring Talk. I am George Schlackek. The one and only. And this is me taking you across Canada, coast to coast, on a bicycle. You can check previous episodes to see how I got to White River, Ontario, which is where we're starting right now. The day was Monday, July the 10th, 2017. It was a very damp morning in White River. My tent was wet both from the outside and the inside of the fly. I was grateful that the inside of the tent had stayed dry, but it wasn't comfortable as you could really feel the dampness. I took the tent down and did my best to shake off the water before packing it away. Since I was out of fuel for my camping stove, I decided to have coffee and breakfast at the nearby A&W. Like all typical fast food breakfast deals, this wasn't really enough, but it was something to get me started. Before hitting the highway, I went to the local home hardware and bought a liter of methyl hydrate, my camping fuel. By the time I finally hit the road, it was almost 10 and the fog had dissipated. I could tell it was going to be a nice day as the sun was warming me up already. The ride started out easy with hills that were not nearly as steep and long as I had become accustomed to. The wind got quite strong at times. Sometimes it was helping, but it seemed to shift frequently. I made a stop at the next rest area to have some sandwiches and completely dry out my tent. See, uh, I just had a snack here, not a full lunch. My breakfast was earlier, but breakfast at A&W costs your fortune and is pretty anemic. You know, there's not much there. At least I had a good coffee. <laughs> and now uh, I had my my tent out and my sleeping bag because everything was a little damp from the fog this morning and I'm good to go I'm gonna go all the way to Wawa and then uh, probably a little bit beyond today because I want to get some distance covered this was a good decision because it would turn out to be the only chance I get to do that if somebody could come out with an invention you know some kind of treatment like a pill or a cream or whatever that works both against uh, black flies mosquitoes and sunscreen that'd be something i'd buy these black flies i'm telling you they get inside your t-shirt and you don't know how they got there but they're so tiny and uh yeah they bite the ride toward Wawa continued quite nice, but traffic was heavy at times, which definitely took away from it. The highway was in pretty poor condition on this stretch, so I had almost no shoulder to ride on at times. Then I stopped at what looked to be an old motel that was completely abandoned and had obviously been vandalized. Violence this far away from civilization along the Trans-Canada Highway? If you know the story of this place, leave me a comment. I'm curious. About 20 kilometers before Wawa, it got really bad. The road surface was rough. It appeared to have been prepared for paving some time ago. I wasn't ready for what followed next though. The road, the famous Trans-Canada Highway, was now a gravel road. The part where cars traveled was compacted well enough, but the space beside it was loose and hard to get through by bike. Then I reached the actual construction zone and it got worse still. Now there was only one lane alternating directions. The stretch was too long for me to get through within the time allocated. As a result I was facing oncoming traffic and had no place to keep riding. Oh. 
How to get off the bike to avoid getting killed and breathe the dust of dozens of vehicles, all of which seem to go faster than the speed limit in the construction zone. I'm on the Trans-Canada Highway, believe it or not. Look at all the dust over there. The road remained gravel all the way to within one kilometer of Wawa. It was a horrible ride. I had to find an alternate route. The Trans-Canada Highway was simply a disaster, completely unsafe. I informed myself about the alternative at the visitor center in town. Thankfully, one existed. Secondary highways 101 and 129 would be much quieter, leading through remote wilderness. The downside would be a lack of services and even just places to stop. I cooked some lunch outside the visitor center while mulling it over in my mind. There was a huge sculpture of a goose and many people were stopping to take pictures. Some came to chat. I made the decision to go the quiet route. It meant about 340 kilometers with no services at all outside of cell phone range. Sounds crazy? Well, in my mind it was life and tour saving. I really didn't feel safe on the Trans-Canada Highway at all. Before starting my trek down the lonely highway, I stopped for groceries and bought enough food to last three days. Then I made another stop at the ATM. I also sent a text message to Barbara explaining that she would not hear from me for about three days, but to call the authorities if it would be five or more. As you can imagine, this led to a bit of an exchange, but hey, my time was limited as I was determined to get started on this and stealth camp somewhere outside of Wawa. The road started off great. A perfect shoulder to ride on and almost no traffic. Beautiful country with lots of lakes was all around me. I rode for about 15 kilometers before even thinking about where I would spend the night. But it was getting later and I would have to find a place to set up the tent, so I started scanning the surrounding area for potential spots. The terrain just off the road didn't look suitable at all, with lots of vegetation, water and some cliffs. Then I saw a clearing where a hydro line was crossing the road and thought I could just set up somewhere at the edge of it. It seemed like the perfect idea until I saw a huge black bear snooping around in the bushes. <laughs> that was enough motivation to keep going. What had I got myself into? There would be nothing but wilderness and, and in less than an hour it was going to get dark. My heart was pounding as I was cranking out the riding performance of my life. Time went by and kilometers passed nothing but wilderness. Finally I reached an area that had a forest road branch off and a sign welcoming forest users. This was a bit of a relief but mama bear was still fresh on my mind so I had to take some precautions. There was three days worth of food packed in my panniers. I had read of people hanging their food into a tree so it would be out of reach. I had never done this and I was worried that if I was going to do this the wrong way, goofy as I am, maybe my food would get consumed by some other savvy wildlife. Some of my food was in cans, the pasta was dry and the cheese and salami were in a plastic bag, inside a cooler bag, inside a pannier, surrounded by other stuff. 
In the end, I decided to lock the bike to a tree, complete with all the panniers, about 100 meters away from the tent. If a bear would discover it, the animal would be busy far enough away and I'd be okay. There were plenty of good spots to camp, so I picked one I liked. After setting up my tent, I had a quick snack, checked if my phone had service, which it didn't, and then settled down in the tent just before it got pitch dark. It had been a 136 or so kilometer day according to my odometer. So I fell asleep pretty quickly. Intense cycling will do that to you. All the thoughts that had gone through my mind while on the road were simply gone. What do you think happened the next morning? I'd be left to my own devices if anything or anyone messed with my bike or my food. I didn't even know my exact location. Just a rough idea of how far from Wawa I had ridden. There was a lot of remote area still ahead of me. Even two full days of cycling might not get me back to civilization. A minor mechanical failure or a flat tire could have dire consequences. What could possibly go wrong? Join me for it when I present episode 87. I'd appreciate it if you gave this video a thumbs up, left a comment, shared the link and of course subscribe if you haven't yet. Thanks for all that. More on this tour in the playlist on the right.